Hi, everyone. Welcome to Office Hours. Uh, if you're at YouTube and you'd like to make your way all the way over to uh, be part of our community, uh, you need to click on the link right below, and then you'll that'll take you to Zoom. You'll register in Zoom. Then you click on the link that's in the chat, and it'll take you to Mukana. And that's where we're actually asking questions and, uh, and chatting with each other all morning. Uh, if um, you are watching this, you're going to ask questions there. But if you want to answer the questions, if you want to be on the actual panel, you just need to get here early. We uh, do mic checks at 6.40 to 6.45, somewhere in that range. Uh, once we start doing the mic checks, that's as big as the panel is going to get for the day. So uh, you need to be here by 6.40 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. We open the doors at 6 a.m. So you've got a little time. You can come in, you can check your mics, you can check your, uh, make sure that everything's just working right. We're having coffee and tea and figuring out what we're going to I don't know what we're going to figure out. We just we just sit there and chat. Um, and then uh, we start at seven, seven o'clock. We uh, start answering general questions. These are any questions that you have around media and uh, virtual production. And so um, it's, a, it's a good place to ask centuries of experience here uh, the spread across this panel. So it's a great place to ask those questions. And you should ask those questions early. Uh, you know, the earlier we ask the questions, the earlier we stack those questions up. Um, you know, the faster the show goes. Um, if we ask them all at the end, we don't get to cover them as well. So definitely ask your questions early and think about them between shows, write them down somewhere and then bring them in and throw them in here and let us uh, chew on them a little bit. A second hour is uh, usually something that we've decided is important. Uh, today, we've got Ray Maxwell. He's going to be talking about uh, color science and color theory, and we're very excited about it. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to have uh, the, educa um, the education group from South by Southwest on in the second hour, and then we have a third and fourth hour uh, on Saturday. We've, we've got Andy Carluccio is going to be here. He is the uh, founder of Zoom, uh, of the company that builds Zoom OSC. Zoom OSC is something that extends the power of Zoom much further than what, what uh, we normally have in Zoom, and so we're starting a five-week course uh, with, with Andy uh, so it starts off tomorrow, 9, 9 a.m. to 11. He's going to give us an introduction to Zoom OSC and then homework. I know you thought you, you graduated from homework, but you're going to get homework, things to work on, things to do. And then we'll, um, we will then be able to work with Andy each week to uh, kind of learn how to use Zoom, Zoom OSC. I'm really excited about that. So that's what's coming up uh, in the near future. Uh, if you actually want to uh, share what we're doing, uh, the, the bigger this gets, the more fun we have, um, you can. And uh, what you want to do is you, you want to not use the, your own link. You'll use the link that I just put into Mukana. That's the best place to, that's the best link to share so that other people can register. And uh, let's go ahead and jump into the questions. They'll we start with TJ Asher this morning from Minneapolis, who asks, can Sky, who's in the panel, give us an update on how his latest escapade with Matt in the kitchen and the execs from Amazon went? Be happy to. Yeah. Jeffrey, Jeffrey Powers saved my day. <laughs> because yesterday when when setting up, I was not able to get the PTZ camera that John Preto has so graciously allowed me to use to uh, function correctly. And consequently, we were able to over Zoom at uh, about an hour before the show. Um, determine what we needed to do. We ended up with the iPhone 12 in the, in the, as the Skycam hanging down over the, the desk. So again, to offer 40 executives... Uh, we had sent them uh, the box of the food that we were going to be cooking, and it was a four-course meal. So we planned on about two hours. Turned out it was about five and a half. They were having so much fun. And we just paced it, and opposed to being on a television show that, uh, I mean, a TV morning talk show that you got to blast everything out in under five minutes, we had two, what we thought was two hours. And what was fun is, after we did the whole meet, they actually participated and we were able to re-engage with them. And what we're seeing is so many people bringing out their children, bringing out their pets, bringing out their puppies. And so it's just a real communal experience of team building and connecting in a different uh, way over food. And of course, Madeline is just sparkling the whole time in her in her pink uh, chef's coat telling letterman stories telling you know daily uh, stories from her executive producer history so it's it's it is uh delicious sorry fun and delicious is our our new mantra and what we really for me story is is qualified when somebody else tells it for you and after two and a half hours we were done doing the eating 
we just left the Zoom room open. I felt like I was at a restaurant, a restaurant tour or something, and the people just wanted to hang out back in the back room that they had rented. And so they just kept talking another hour and a half, just chitting and chatting. So that was the uh, that was a fun experience that uh, that we we will hope to be able to do a lot more for a lot of other people. Oops, mute. Sorry. Uh, one of the things that I've been thinking about, uh, just with related to Mad in the Kitchen and just in general at home, is you think about preparation as something you have to do so that you can have the meal. Like, you know, like you, you, you have to, like, this seems like a lot of work. I started making my own corn tortillas this week. This is my new, my new little thing. I got my new press. So I was making corn tortillas. <laughs> They're a lot of work for one tortilla. You know, like, like it's a lot of, you know, for, you know, to put it out. And so I was thinking, this is a lot of work for one tortilla. But what happens is, is that now that we've all started cooking, you know, my wife and I sit around the, uh, you know, we sit around the island and she's cooking dinner and I'm prepping things and everything else. And we're talking about the day and we're talking about, um, you know, the process and everything else. And I realized that, that it can just be, you know, the cooking is part of the dinner. Like the, the actual preparation and process of making the meal is as much the meal. In fact, we spend more time doing that together than we actually do eating it. And so it's just an interesting, um, different way of thinking about it, that the whole process is part of it. You know, or is it? I mean, I know some people know that. Maybe it's just me it's just realizing well, that. Because yeah. I think a lot of people think about how do I make a really quick dinner? How do I make something really fast so I could go do the other parts of things in my life as opposed to how does this become a, yeah, maybe it takes an hour to put together, an hour and a half to put together, but it's all part of us sitting around, you know, talking as my kids get older now, I'm putting, I'm putting uh, them to work. I've been teaching my son knife skills <laughs> so, so that he doesn't cut his fingers off. And, um, and, uh, but there, you know, he's cutting onions and cutting things pro properly, like le learning. I didn't learn how to cut an onion until like a year ago and, or two years ago, maybe. And, and he, He's got it all down, slices it this way, and then cuts come comes across, then comes comes down. And so so those are the kind of things that I think it's just interesting as a group project. Go ahead, Sky. Well, before, during, and after, I will take even that idea of, of community and connections into the washing of the dishes. I've learned more about right. family members because we're in there again doing the process right. together. And it's a it's a point of accomplishment and anecdotes and you're doing something active rather than having to have a conversation. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Next uh, next question. Thanks, Scott. Scott, your America. connection, I don't know if you're on Wi Fi or not, your connection breaking up a bit. Yeah, so, I'm you know. sorry. Yep, Thank no you. Worries. Next question. Maranatha Spanish Church from Grand Rapids, Michigan. Can ATEM Mini Pro produce a video output with just a lower third video to merge with another video output? Go ahead, Roscoe. Yeah, it doesn't generate in the sense, all it does is store graphics that are generated by other programs. So it doesn't generate a lower third, but it certainly can output a stored lower third out video. And it has an upstream key and a downstream key so it can do the layering itself. Yeah, if you're gonna, if you are gonna do a lower third and you're just gonna serve it up as a graphic, the thing to know is that it does what it what it will not do is a key fill output. So the A10 Mini itself doesn't do the key fill output. You'll need to do a. There's probably a way to do a macro that way, but I, I'd have to think about it. You probably could theoretically do a key filled output um, out of it. I would just have to think through that process. But um, but in general, the A10 Mini uh, would would not do. Um, that so you you would need to luma key it into whatever you're putting it into it and at that point i'm not sure that you're getting a lot of value out of the a10 mini other than being a small device that holds it you can have a laptop or a or a ipad or lots of other things would do the same have the same uh, effect um next question uh, Brian Enrod of New York City said, is there a kvm that's a keyboard video and mouse circuit that can be controlled with a stream deck go ahead tucker I'd say that uh, any professional line KVM, well, actually, well, I'll start with any professional line KVM um, that has like RS-232 or network control can be controlled via companion because you can send direct UDP or TCP commands um, from companion. So that's pretty straightforward. Um, there's probably a way with contact closures to control the rest of them. Yep, absolutely. What, what is your favorite KVM right now, Tucker? It has been a little while since I dug into KVMs. I believe it was a. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna miss the name if I say it. So I'll I'll look real quick. Next question. Uh, go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, what I, what I've been using now is a it's a software solution called Synergy, and it 
it works pretty well cro across platforms. So, yeah, excellent. Next question. JJ McKenna of uh, Santa Venetia says, in an internet intranet environment, what non-cloud software solution works best for audio collaboration? And they're on campus or in a studio, perhaps using Dante or CobraNet. I mean, this is where, I mean, what we've done for a lot of, I guess part of it depends on how many people. We had it. We had kind of a long discussion this morning about that. Um, for a lot of internal communication, um, you know, what we've used now, I've used two different things. One is for our smaller kits. I've used Dante and uh, Studio Technologies, uh, their their little belt packs, and we were talking about how to scale that, um, and you need to have some uh, larger pieces of hardware to to deal with the routing. Um, I most of my work has been four to six packs maximum, and then after that, we go into ClearCom. And uh, with a clear comic clips, I mean, if you really want that something to turn on that just works and, and just scales and, you know, it's, it'll keep scaling as far as you possibly would want in an intranet, you know, something like a clear comic clips is going to just keep, you're just going to keep on adding cards and you can tie it into Dante and you can tie it into everything else. And it's got wireless, so you can tie it into free speaks. And I mean, so you got to decide how far you want to go. If you're trying to be a little bit more scrappy then um, you know, something like unity plus, uh, Dante and studio technologies can make a lot of sense. They're going to be less expensive, um, but a little bit more, you have to be a little bit more technical um, than you would uh, with ClearCom. Um, so, so those are the, those are the things that I would kind of consider. Go ahead, Be Beju and then Jesse. Yeah, I'm reading the question more about rather than comms about transporting audio between different devices or different studios for collaboration okay. rather than comms itself. So for that, I, I definitely would say Dante seems to be a more robust solution, Dante or AES67. Yeah. I would normally say avoid AVB just because you need dedicated uh, specialized uh, switches for them, which are much more expensive as well and not that much support. So a anything AES67, which, which works with AES67, which includes Dante and Ravina. Mm -hmm. So that would probably work very well. And it's pretty stable as well. The, uh, if you need more control, you can go for the domain manager options, but that starts getting very expensive. And the thing to remember is if you're talking about collaboration, like live collaboration, like musicians trying to collaborate, uh, anything that turns things into bits, you're going to get enough latency that it's not really going to work. Um, so you just need to know that that's not like live collaboration over, over that is probably not going to be as successful as, as you'd like. Um, go ahead, Jesse. Yeah, I'm um, working on a similar then, project right now. Um, actually, we're designing a system with QSYS, which will work on AES67, uh, Cobranet, Dante, uh, QLAN, you know, their own proprietary format. So that can expand uh, quite a bit and also has DSP processing built in. So uh, hit me up in Discord if you want to talk about that. Go ahead, Tucker. Yeah, and within the intranet, then the collaboration, you can do real-time playing, but but... Like Alex said, you can just look at your latencies, especially if it's across campus. If it's a really large, large area, just make sure you watch your latencies because you can run into issues. Yeah, go ahead, Leland. I was just going to mention the fact that voice meters V-band supplement is a way to IP transfer audio to two different devices that you could plug in any audio sources you needed to in a hardware sense, looking at it virtually. And then using V-band, those can be transported anywhere across the IP network. And you're clicking a little bit, Leland. Um, next question. Yep. Uh, Manila Lozano is in with, a few days ago, you talked about Audio Hijack. What's the version which works with the Waves plugins? I gather that there was a problem with the latest version. Go ahead, Roscoe, and then Greg. Uh, went to 3.82, which is supposed to have the fixes in it. However, on a, I haven't tested it on, on my M1, but on the old Macs, it, it, Ulean is crashing every time I launch it, even in 3.8.2. That's not the Waves plugin. It's just another plugin that does the same thing Waves does. So I, so it's not all stable yet. Greg. Okay, The um, what happened is in mine, it's it moved to Audio Hijack 2, not Audio Hijack regular, Audio Hijack 2. So, um, and, that, and that, solved, that solved the issue. So I had to uninstall the regular uh, regular audio hijack, and let me see if I can get a version number. Okay, it looks like this is a three point eight point two, and that's working. Yeah. Okay. 
This but this now says Audio Hijack Three, so mm -hmm. they're uh, they're moving along. They're doing something. Great. Next question. Philip Oler of Katona, New York, is in with. Is there a way to eliminate the Skype watermark on the macOS version of that program? Yeah. <laughs> Is it, it it's it, it's command uh, minus? Is that right? Um, yeah. So if you hit command minus, it'll keep on basically getting um, the the interface will keep on getting smaller, and then uh, and I think that now it's constantly changing, but generally it'll just keep the interface will just keep on getting smaller, and you'll always see it like at the beginning of Twit. Sometimes the Twit shows you'll see the the image flicker like this, and that's because someone's hitting minus the whole, like command minus 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 minus. It doesn't work on the PC. Uh, just on the Mac, and so you can you can basically scale it out, scale it out into nothing, and you'll and then and then scale up the image a little bit. Uh, go ahead, Leland, and then and then Stuart. Uh, you, you can't hear you at all now, Leland. You were clicking before, and now you're just silent. Um, go ahead, Stuart. Just an alternative uh, for PC users, uh, if you want to be really sneaky, and this will work with the Zoom logo as well. Create a lower third that uses the same color as or the same opacity as the Skype or the Zoom logo and mm. just overlay that at the bottom and put all your titles or your graphics and whatever you over that. Just ignore mm. that little bit of the screen that's got Zoom or Skype in there and it might look a little bit professional. Yeah, the, uh, what we found with, um, if you're using Zoom, we strongly prefer, if you can get a 1080p signal, so what you need is a business account then you have a 1080p, then you can request a 1080p signal. And then on rooms that have point to point, you'll get 1080p. That image coming out of there is, in my opinion, better than Skype. And so, and it's, and it has less, it's more stable. It has less schmutz all over it. So it's actually a better solution if you can get to it. You just have to kind of go through a couple of hoops. The Skype, of course, will just work when you open it up without doing that, except for the fact that Skype breaks it every two weeks. So you get an update every two weeks from Skype. And something horribly will change, which is why we stopped using it. And so, um, you know, so that that's the real problem is, is that Microsoft has no real respect for production, you know, on Skype. I mean, I, I know that they're focused on Teams, but they will constantly upend your entire production if you base anything on Skype. Um, it, it is truly a, a amateur, like civilian people play with it kind of thing. And if you want anything more out of it, you're using, <laughs> using the wrong tool. It's just that you just have to limit your expectations to what it's built for. Um, and, but Microsoft, if, if you're doing production with Skype, Microsoft doesn't care about you. Just, just know that they, they care about teams. Um, so anyway, next, next question. Sonny Nofield, who's in Winnipeg, Manitoba, Canada says in vMix, is there a way to see video countdowns when the video is embedded into another input? I only see it below the program window when playing the video itself. I'm just looking over that question again here. Yep. Tucker? Um, in Companion, uh, something I just learned yesterday, um, there's a video feedback um, that you can use and on the button it actually gives you your countdown right there and then I think there's a couple other solutions that read the time code but That's I just cool. learned that yesterday from Cherig and it is again people that don't have the preconceived notions that we do from pr production yeah that's great it's great so by the way and, and I think that's one of the real powers of this group is the fact that we have a bunch of people that know what we know and then you have folks that are not don't know they don't know what they don't know and they don't know what they should know and they don't know what they should be doing and and as as a result they're out there breaking things and and there's a huge value to people like us who have already filtered out all these things that you can't do you know we've you know and things grow up in those areas we don't see them anymore because you know the as humans what we do is filter out things that we don't think are important so we can focus on things that we can't that we do think are important and so um, and so the thing is, is that uh, the heterogeneous nature of our group is a big, huge value. We as folks that have a little bit more experience can help point people with less experience towards a solution and save them possibly years <laughs> of time and, and have them get accept, um, successful. But people who are getting started are going to show us new, exciting ways of doing things that we wouldn't try and we couldn't try because we're working on events that can't fail. And so we can't go, you know, on a little boat out there. We've got a big battleship that we're moving and we, you know, we can't take a chance of going to into those rocks. Whereas someone else is out there with a little skiff and, just, you know, and, and um, that's the, 
you know, the opportunity. And that, I think it's one of the real values of what we're doing here. Go ahead, Stuart. Shirag Shahida in the chat for the win with a link to a time code reader on the vMix website. That is a brilliant little uh, link to post. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question. Moving on to Dan Huber from Erie, Pennsylvania. And Dan, uh, here at the panel, I think, says, was there a reason why the second hour focus wasn't the first hour with a general question and answer being after? Because the first hour was first. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I mean it's literally like we were doing it at seven o'clock and uh the reason that we did that we, we did it that way is because we added on an, a second hour um and, and to do to, because the, the bottom line was is that we didn't want to give up q a and we um you know the q a is valuable and so we didn't want to give that up but we wanted to have the freedom to just say hey we're only going to talk about one thing for another hour and so we're like well Let's add it on to the end. You know, we didn't want to come. I didn't want to start it earlier. We, we used the earlier part as a planning and, you know, and hanging out and figuring out our tech stuff and everything else. And so, so it just, that was the time slot. But yeah, I'd love to say that there was more science to it, but it was because, you know, it, it was the second thing to sh show up. Anyway, if, if we had started doing only like a user group type thing where it was one thing, it probably would have been second. Um, but I, but I am always very, I think very hard about changing things. People are pattern oriented. And so, you know, I, I have learned over many years to be very careful when, when people want to change time zones or change things or change, like, like, you know, it's, it's, if it's working, you kind of leave the knife where it is. So, so, um, so anyway, I, so I, I think that that's, that's why we, we don't change things very often. We add to them, but we don't move things very often. Go ahead, Stuart. And then Tucker. I got, I got to ask, would anyone really want to have the deep dive into a subject before you have warmed your brain up with the Q&A yeah, I mean, in the morning? For me, it's the end of the day. So it's like I can do it either way, but uh, the Q&A gets your brain ticking over and finding answers before you get into a, a, I agree. a concentrated I agree. topic. I agree. Go ahead, Tucker. Yeah, that, that's what I was going to say. The brilliance of what you've done, Alex, is, is that, and it, I recommend it so many times for so many people that are doing meetings of like, listen, having a general open discussion prior to is so valuable for exactly what, what you just said, Stuart, of just warming everybody up, getting your brain going, getting, and it, not even just warming your brain up, but getting you engaged, getting people to lean in and like, they're, they start actively listening. If you start yeah. presenting to somebody right off the bat, your first 15 minutes of presentation are lost. Well, and, and I think that, you know, the way I used to always start my classes um, when I when I when I was teaching at San Francisco State was I would uh, it was all Q&A at the beginning. So I guess it was pretty much the same thing, which is that I would you know, we would uh, I, I usually only had about 10, 10 or 15 minutes of lecture for, a, you know, an hour and a half um, space. And what we would do is we would do Q&A for the first 30 to 45 minutes, you know, and then there'd be 15 minutes of of lecture and then they'd start working on the problem and we'd answer questions while they were working on the problem this is for learning how to do visual effects and um and then they would uh and then they'd go home with the homework you know like, like they would continue this problem at home and um and then that was it you know and then they'd come back in and we'd have the questions and then there'd be a little something let me talk about something new just for a little bit of time to kind of and we you know and, and that would be devolve into questions and so I, I agree with you that i think that like i'm working on this trying to figure out this webinar that i want to do or i don't know what you call it anymore but an event and i realized i'm very much planning to do the same model like when i really thought about what i wanted i was like i want you know the actual event is probably going to happen at six o'clock at night but at four o'clock we're all going to come in and hang out and then at five o'clock we're going to do general q a and then at six they'll have someone speak and they'll speak for 20 minutes that's how much time they have to do to do their little talk and then we'll do Q and A until people stop asking questions. Then we'll do another one the next day. You know, like and so the, instead of you know every speaker will have their own evening. You know, people can come in for that one e that one thing. You know, and we'll discuss it. But the idea is is that we get everybody warmed up if they want to. But we'll tell them when it's coming. If they only want to come for when the speakers. If you only want the protein, you can do that. But you know, you can you kind of do want to kind of warm everybody up. Our next question. JJ McKenna is back from Santa Venetia in Marin County, California. Is there a CAD or mapping software interface that allows for deep site survey information for physical spaces today? Power outlets, room dimensions, light hanging space, things like that. Go ahead, Leland. 
You're basically referring to a LIDAR process, and there is a canvas or canvas.io is the software site you can take a look at. It's available for iPhone, works particularly with the LIDAR component in the iPhone 12. So you will have to have that unit in order to use it properly. I can't guarantee the accuracy of it at this time, but I'm also good friends with a gentleman uh, who works at the LS at LSU down in Louisiana, and he runs a GPS department over the entire state monument system and uses a lot of these types of LIDAR applications. His good friend is very closely tied into the creator of one of them himself. So uh, if there's information you need, we might be able to get it for you. Just let me know after hours. The term that you're looking for to do what you're trying to do is called BIM, <laughs> Building Information Models. So this is beyond LIDAR. This is really the, the, when you're asking for where all the outlets are and where everything else is, what you're looking to do is research BIM, Building Information Models. Um, and the leader in this area is Autodesk. So AutoCAD, it will have a lot of those things. Um, so a lot of times you're taking LIDAR and using a variety of BIM models to take that data and turn it into pipes and things and identify it and everything else. But to find what the information that you're looking for, you're looking for software and platforms that support BIM. Go ahead, uh, John, and then, and then Beju. That's interesting you say that. One of the original BIM inventors was a startup here in Las Vegas, which was acquired by IBM. Uh, but I know a lot of the guys in this space are using Vectorworks as well. Oh yeah, Vectorworks is another, another great one. I mean, AutoCAD is probably the, the biggest name in town. SketchUp also is something that people refer to as, you know, as something that's related to that. Um, but you are right that Vectorworks is, is popular as well. Um, Beju? Yeah, I'll just add to that Autodesk. Basically, their BIM product is Revit, I believe, R-E-V-I-T. Yep. That's the main thing. You can basically import your Autodesk DWG files into Revit and that you can build a whole three-dimensional layer and you can also it has very good management so you can have work on one part of the drawing change bring the changes in compare them make sure so it's basically really good for collaboration or for managing a project as a whole it is re really complicated to manage and it is really heavy on the system but if you really want if it's, it seems to be more popular with bigger corporates and for bigger projects uh, and vector work seems to be a bit more popular with for smaller shops and especially more in the u.s i think outside the u.s it seems to be more autodesk yeah. And, and these, these things get into, you know, they scale up. So when you, you go into, you know, BIM is the building level, then GIS is the city level, you know, so there is, you know, things, you know, so you get into the, um, there's lots of this information that is available and engineering uses it all the time. So you kind of go up from BIM to GIS is kind of the, the conversion of that. And if we want to have a second hour on that, that's where bringing Fred in can <laughs> fix talk to that a lot, uh, Chris, and then, and then Leland. Over the years, I've cut a ton of videos for Autodesk and the stuff they do is fascinating. It's really like, I've done stuff where it's like demo reels of what, you know, the different renderings that all the software does. And it's like, yeah, you know, it's, it's next level. But you can have it's it, really you can have it visualize all yeah. the pipes. Like here's right. all the oh, plumbing exactly. and all the plumbing, just it's everything goes away except for the plumbing and then everything but the electricity, then everything but the, you know, like the a AC and all of those things can be stacked onto each other and put together. It's quite a thing. And yeah, they add just, the, the added, right. they, they add the added dimension of time so that right. as a building is progressing, you know exactly when things have to arrive on okay. site well, and, and get installed and what it gets And that's, and that's one of the things that Microsoft's, uh, Hollow, HoloLens does really well is you can actually put the HoloLens on on a construction site or even on a building with the, if it has all the BIM information and you can look over and it'll give you an x-ray of the wall. <laughs> like, like the wall that you're standing, you can look over and you can see this is where the pipes are, you know? And so it's, it's, uh, it, 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 the, the information is, is pretty amazing uh, when it, when you get into that, into that world. Go ahead, Leland. Yeah, I just wanted to clarify that app canvas.io is con it's basically a component between LIDAR and all those apps that were mentioned after the one that I mentioned. So it's that in between to take LIDAR into a CAD format so that you can import them into all those other software. Yep. Yep. Tucker? Yeah, with we're kind of talking in chat just to touch about it, but um, Vectorworks really is kind of the king in the production space of in production layout and think yeah in production yeah and uh if you if you are headed in that direction i would recommend taking a look it has fantastic lighting visualization fantastic just all your layouts plus so many vendors use it that we do a lot of collaboration where we hand a file over and they put their plot on it we were you know right. we all collaborate on the same file so yep. the, the way i would kind of the way i think of it is is that fast and furious is kind of sketch up 
you know, is that, you know, it's, there's, you know, it's easy to throw together ideas. We've done inc an incredible amount of work in SketchUp where we visualize a setup, a shoot, a process, everything else. Then when you go into the next level of that, saying we need more technical, you know, for events, then Vectorworks becomes the next thing that you use that goes a step up from, from SketchUp in, in technical uh, capacity. And then when you move into actual construction, then you move to the AutoCAD solutions, the Revit's and so on and so forth. So that's kind of the, um, the, the progression that we've seen anyway. The next question. Jose Munguia, and I hope I'm doing your name justice, in Sacramento says Adobe Premiere just got the speech-to-text feature activated in the beta version of the app yesterday. It's one of the best AIs I have seen. What do you folks think of it? I haven't seen it yet. I haven't played it's with it. what yet. I've heard. It's been around for a while, but it wasn't available for a period of time. They shut it down, but it was tested previously, and its accuracy has been really high, and people have been boasting about it, but I haven't used it yet. You're still clicking uh, on your site, Leland. Um, Roscoe? Yeah, documentary filmmakers really like this because they could throw their films, uh, their recordings in, and then they could search later in the database to find footage. So that's been the strongest use. I don't think anyone's using it to actually generate scripts or... No, yeah, I mean, it's been, it's super valuable. I know, um, you know, for a lot of this, for exactly what you said is to find things and to be able to find where did they say that or how do they, I'm looking for this thing that they were talking about or subject matter. It's not, yeah, we don't usually use it for the scripts or, or other things, but when we, when we have that data, it makes it a lot easier to find where you are in the, in, the, in a, especially if you're shooting a hundred to one or a thousand to one for a documentary, um, you know, having that, that data becomes super valuable. Next question. Comes from somebody named Alex L. from Nevada, California. How does latency affect the stability of Unity comms? Talker. All right. Um, it's a plant. It is a plant. Uh, so the latency, it depends. So Unity is very dependent on whatever network connection you have for your specific um, device, whatever you're using. So um, if you're on really what I suggest to most people is one, make sure you don't have a VPN active, make sure that uh, on the phone or device that you're using to um, use LTE over Wi-Fi, And that is just a, on average, most Wi-Fi environments are not great for real time communications, like very, very, you know, low latency. What I tell most people is start with the default latency of unity, which is 120 or 140 milliseconds. If you have a problem, double that number. You can get more granular and like really tweak it and get the, the you know, okay, best possible latency for my network connection. Most people just need the problem to go away. And so I usually say just double the number. If it continues to happen, double it again, then slowly back it down if you need to. But most people don't have time to really dig in. So, All right. That's great. Next question. Moving on to Alton Christensen in Brooklyn, who asks, might the panel be able to suggest a Polson or Pile-like headset mic with an integrated in-ear monitor, a single cable to plug in, and he's looking for something for less than $100? Jeffrey Powers? No, uh, not for $100. There's only one thing out there that I found, <laughs> and uh, I've done a lot of research on this. One thing, it's called ClearCom cc27 and it does have an earbud and uh and a microphone the biggest problem with that is uh, it's about 150 dollars to 170 dollars. the biggest problem is if one of those things go you just might as well chuck the whole thing away because it's it's just not going to go and th that earpiece looks like the old-fashioned not in the ear type piece but just kind of sits on the on the ear rim so it might not be as effective as you want go ahead bill yeah, I'm going to support exactly what he said. And the, the reason I'm saying that is because even here on office hours, when I moved from being a very occasional headset or earbud user to having to do it every day, I've gone through three different forms of that just to find one that matched what I needed, something that doesn't block my ears so that it ends up, uh, you know, I had some problems with it, just didn't get enough air to aerate my ear. And so I was starting to get a little itchy things. I didn't want that. I moved to a smaller one. You just want to tune up what you're what you're working with, you have to work with it every day. You had Roscoe and then Mickey. I put in just, it's really small cable wrap, the spiral wrap. It's really the best way run with two cables, but you can keep them together and keep them from having to get twisted up and stuff. So good. Mickey and then Beijing. Yeah. Uh, over a hundred dollars. Uh, DPA also has it, but it's of course DPA prices. Um, 
And a question back to Alton, like, are you looking for program audio or just comms? Because if it's the comms, you might be able to find some affordable comms headsets around. I'm it's sorry, network. DPA has an integrated headset and mic? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll Google it and put the link in the chat. <laughs> yes, yes, please. Yes, please. Uh, Beju? Yeah, I just found this gaming headset, which has a removable microphone set up. So I've been planning to test it in the next day or two to see how well it sounds. I'll probably bring it in tomorrow to see how it looks. Let's but it do is it pretty right small. now. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, I don't want to it's end up. Show. Yeah. But so something like this might work. It's basically a gaming headset. It's a Chinese cheap one. I think yeah. it was about $10. So like, My biggest complaint with gaming headsets is the um, the range. You know, the audio range is very low. You know, so it's like yep. one thousand to four thousand or something like, or or eight hundred to you know five thousand or whatever, and it's just very thin. I find that to be taxing to listen to, you know, over time, and so, um, and I'm always surprised that that the pile or the Pulson does so well. But I do think that to the point that everyone said is that I mean, some shrink wrap, and you know, you can make your own for thirty bucks or forty dollars, you know, and get something that probably sounds as good as anything is going to sound under a hundred. That's the that's the big thing. Go ahead, Jeffrey, and then Mickey. So doesn't a gaming headset have to avoid certain frequencies so you can still hear the action behind things? Yeah, but we're not gaming. We're we're having a conversation. Yeah, I don't, yeah. I, it's and fine that's, for that's as a gaming. Point, yeah. yeah, as a, as a gaming headset, it's fine. I just don't I don't like it as a conversation headset. Go ahead, Mickey. Yeah, I put the link in the in the chat to the DPA headset, um, and okay. I that's the sound of a, of Alex's credit cards shivering. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I was like, oh, I can have it in all in one piece. Oh, come on. All right. Uh, next question. Greg Kurta, our friend here on the panel from Stangshire, Norway, says, is there a separate meeting link for Andy's seminar or just a continuation of our regular meeting? The first one will be a uh, continuation of our current one. After that, the next, fo the following weeks will be a, um, there'll be separate links for that. And that's because he needs different access than what we have for the webinar. So we'll have to create another meeting. We'll put that, we'll put all of that out next week to, to set that up. So I, and I, and fundamentally, yeah, we, I just couldn't figure out how to, how to get that working in the current production schedule. My production schedule just emptied <laughs> for the next week. So I'm, so I'll, I'll fix all that stuff, but, but the, um, anyway, go ahead, Sky. Can it be recorded so so we can? It's going to be show? recorded. It's still Thank going to be on YouTube. YouTube. We're not. YouTube. Yeah, we're not taking it off yet. Absolutely. Um, next question. Dean Robinson from Ireland. I haven't seen many people from Ireland, in the, so welcome. Can we talk about NDI a little? How beneficial to us is it uh, just yet in live production scenarios? What software is available for working best at the moment, for, and then for certain jobs and so forth? Um, when everyone's waiting <laughs> go ahead jeffrey well there are some there are some companies that are touting that they're all ndi so there must be some sort of validity and in, in, in strengthening the network there's i i use it for my ptz camera it works really well uh, i also use it for you know like uh presentations bring them into screen because they're single usually single frame presentations so if they take another second to load in it's not a big deal and then uh, the other thing, we talked about KVMs before, NDI does have the ability to put, uh, to put software on each machine and turn that into a KVM system. So those are some options. But uh, Leland and then Stuart. All right, I hopefully don't have that voice meter issue because I'm not using it right at the moment. Um, what I'd like to say with regards to NDI is I use it all the time to get video between machines on the internal network, of course. And I think the, the one thing that you'd have to really pay attention to is, oh, for people that are asking what NDI is, it's a network device interface, allows you to take video and audio equipment and broadcast it over IP addresses from computer to computer. So we use it a lot. I try to stay away from the audio aspect of it because we obviously have had problems with it in the past, but I use it for just about everything when it comes to sending video quickly through machines and it's vMix component. I just want to add, if you add the desktop component, which is a separate plugin that you could use or a separate application you can use on any machine, it will instantly find any video and audio sources that you can use in your NDI chain. It's a really nice, small, compact software. Uh, Go ahead, you can uh, Stuart and then Tucker. Okay, what NDI is in its raw form is a MPEG-4 stream. Uh, it's supposed to be extremely low latency. It's probably a little bit better than RTMP or RTSP. It's not as low latency as UDP. 
NDI HX is an extremely long GOP version of NDI, and that one can have issues, as I've spoken about before. Uh, I'm usually using it right now to go between a vMix PC and bring my footage from multiple cameras through into the laptop that I'm running Zoom on through the NDI virtual input. Uh, it makes shifting vision around a network very easy but you need to make sure your network is up to snuff when it comes to the network bandwidth that you've got. And if you do, it becomes reasonably stable. If you don't, like everything else, it falls apart. Uh, uh, go ahead, uh, Tucker, and then Mike. Yeah, uh, as far as it's... Uh, I personally use NDI for um, anything that is not a camera for the most part. So if, if I have a camera in a studio or uh, anything like that, I don't want to accept that latency change and I don't want to accept the risk of it is not a layer one protocol. It is, has, there's a lot of other things going on that, uh, could have to be troubleshot during the, during a production. So I use it for like, uh, shifting vMix callers around. Um, I use it for, you know, on, on physical location, things like that. I use it for, uh, multi-view monitoring, things that are not critical, that sort of thing. In the cloud, I use it extensively. So, uh, But one consideration when you get in the cloud is that you lose the multicast function where they all just find each other automatically. So you have to kind of do some things to work around that. Go ahead, Mike. Yeah, so um, early on, I tried uh, monkeying around with NDI a little bit, and uh, I always had problems with sync issues. Have they straightened that out at all? <clears throat> Excuse me. It's more delay. I mean, it's it's not going to be as fast as as uh, electrical. You know, I mean, so I mean, I I, I think to we'll, we'll move on to the next thing. I, for me, I think NDI is what I'm experimenting with. NDI is specifically in the cloud, so I think it's absolutely necessary. Have to use it. There's no other way to map, move from one app to the other without NDI uh, to make that work. Um, personally, so I wouldn't use NDI in in on the ground. You know, like, like to me, I'm, I'm all, you know, like I just, I've had too many problems with it and it's little glitches and, you know, like little glitches and, and little bits and pieces and audio problems and video problems and, you know, enough of them that on, on, at least on the events that I work on, I don't want to explain to a client why, why, why it didn't go through. So, so anyway, I'm, I, I, we got to move on to the next question. Moving to Jave, Dave Chalmer, Chalmers, excuse me, of Glasgow, Scotland. Anyone have experience of driving an ATEM Mini via MIDI commands looking for basic cut and picture in picture control? Appreciate that he could use OSC open sound control, but hoping for a simple solution. Go ahead, Roscoe. Well, yeah, you could drive it with pretty much any signal you can get to it because it's just code, but um, um, Really, you want to take MIDI and transfer it to OSC and then use the ATEM OSC to talk to it. That's really the way. If you're using ProPresenter, ProPresenter only outputs MIDI. You use Osculator. It's a OSC culator, and then it will transfer MIDI commands into OSC so that you can talk. Right. I mean, trying to just use MIDI is not going to be simpler. It's actually going to be more complicated. Um, you know, so, so getting it to OSC will be the simplest way to, to get that done. Uh, Tucker? Yeah, that's exactly what I was going to say, is that the, it seems like it would be less parts to go MIDI, but uh, but you'd be having to translate commands and things. So yeah, OSC is really the simplest. Yep, Beju. Uh, I believe the ATEM software does support direct MIDI, but has anybody tested just using it with a MIDI control pad on the same machine running ATEM software control? Because there is an option to enable MIDI control directly. I, but I think that's just for the audio, right? I think that's a, a MIDI control for the audio sliders, uh, Tucker. Yeah, I have not tested it, but my understanding of it is that that's the case. It is audio, but I, I do believe they expose some other commands, but it's I, I'm almost positive it is fixed what those commands are. And so that's where you wind up like this MIDI controller outputs this thing. I need to switch that over to this thing because it's the right command that, that the ATEM is listening for. Next question. Peter Moore of Auckland, New Zealand says, sorry if this has been asked recently, but I've been away. What's the latest WRT Unreal versus unit, uh, Unity in Alex's and the Palin's opinion? Which one could we bet on and or should we wait a bit? Uh, Unreal is still leading the thought, you know, thought leadership of the industry. Um, they're just getting a lot more uh you know, a lot of more people are using it um, in broadcast. Most people are using it because it does 2997. So it doesn't, you can't, you can't do, you know, unity is much more of a, it's all in on the virtual end of things. Um, I think that one of the things we have to see is the reason that I've kind of 
paused on Unreal. And we're going to do a lot more with virtual, whether we're doing Unreal or on Un- Nick Justin is going to be doing some more training with us in the near future. So we're going to be doing more of it. We'll most likely will be Unreal um, that we'll I keep on wanting to get our heads around it. Um, my concern about Unreal is, is just watching what Apple does in this year. So I'm kind of just watching, you know, Unreal and Apple are in kind of a head to head battle, which means that it's in Apple's best interest to promote unity. And so, you know, my guess is, is that in, uh, at WWDC is what I'm waiting to see what happens. (laughs) What what example does Apple show when they're talking about AR, you know, they're not going to show unreal. So are are they going to just not show anything or are they going to start showing unity or their own stuff or other things like that? So my big unknown there is, is really not knowing because that's going to, I, you know, Apple pushes the envelope. Most people don't know what we're talking about. Like our, our friends and our family and everything else don't know what we're talking about. When we talk about this stuff, Apple makes it something that they know, you know? And so, and that's the thing that, that I'm un, unclear about. I think that, I think f- getting into a battle with Apple was a unforced error on Epic's side. And I think that, um, so I'm just not clear that I, I, I'm, I definitely want to keep on using Unreal right now because I just know it. And we started with Unity, then we went to Unreal because of 2997. And, and a couple other things. And now we're just, I'm just kind of, we've got plenty in my, plenty on my plate at the moment, but that's what I'm concerned about is that, you know, Apple will bury them, you know? And, and so, um, and so that's, I'm, I'm not putting too much infrastructure into it until I see what, what happens. So next question. Mike Burns here in the panel from Sporkand. My wife does live events for her job and we're looking at Ecamm Live. Anybody using it and the training and support for it look awesome. Anyone want to talk to Ecamm? Go ahead, uh, Leland. Yeah, I've been following Ecamm since it came out a few years back. It was an original one price model, now it's subscription. It is a good, somewhat solid software, basically Apple-oriented only. So you do have to keep that in mind. The one thing I experienced the other day, I was brought on as a guest on AO for Vito, BI.TO's broadcast the other day. I had problems getting into the broadcast through Chrome. I had to actually go to Firefox to get my virtual cams to work on their system. So something to pay attention to going into it. I would test it out a little bit with their free trial first. And if you like it, if it works for your purpose, go for it. But it's not high grade software. It's more of a you know, consumer grade to get started you'll, you'll hit a ceiling pretty quickly if you start doing things that are more complex that's that's always the challenge uh next question well it's from mike as well from spokane he's getting ready to take singing lessons online it's a birthday gift from his wife from a grammy award-winning singer songwriter songwriter he has an at 2020 a sure sm57 a road pod mic and a heil pv30 which one should he use with his soprano voice and wants grant or mickey to weigh in go ahead grant and then mickey and then greg uh, yeah, I would I would think the microphone doesn't matter all that much in that instance. And I would be thinking more about your monitoring. So your side chain, um, I would think it's really important for you to be able to hear exactly what the um, uh, the coach is, is hearing. Uh, and so you, you, you have a really good understanding. It's also good for, for seeing that you're hearing yourself back, getting used to that a little bit. And so you know exactly what, And but yeah, you've got a couple of, um, uh, uh, you've got a dynamic mic there, which might be better, but then, you know, a couple of um, condensers as well. It could be, uh, I, I would, I would try them out and see how you go. Go ahead, Mickey. And then Greg. Yeah, yeah exactly. What is it? I was going to say, I'm sorry to give you non answers, but yeah, pretty much like I would test them with your voice, specifically it your depends. voice. Here we go. Here. Everybody together. <laughs> it depends. All right. Yeah, specifically, like, you know, different voices react differently, uh, different microphones react differently with different voices. So if possible, like have them all plugged in at the same time. But if not, one at a time, sing into the microphones, have a listen, trust, trust your ears, what works, what works best. Go ahead, Greg. Well, there's there's very little left uh, in the field there to uh, to pick from. Uh, but. <laughs> If it were if it were me, I would probably I would probably go for the AT twenty twenty first, and then I'd go to then I'd go to the Heil. The thing about the Heil is it it is a a front address, um, you know, typically used for uh, for uh, podcasting and broadcasting. The AT twenty twenty it gets some really good reviews. People like it, and they've they've picked it out, you know, in blind tests as a nice sounding mic. So. I have one related question, then we'll move on. Uh, the 
One related question, is there any app on the App Store that lets you hear your voice and the music at the same time? It seems like people would want to learn how to sing a song and be able to hear the song off of their, you know, Apple Music or whatever, but be able to hear their voice through their AirPods. Doesn't Smo- Smule do that? Smuley? Are you uh, with the that thing one? I would be really careful with there is that you're you're going to be going through it, DSP. You're going through your computer's processing, and so you're going to be latent coming to your ears, and that's oh. a really big problem, especially if you're trying to get pitch. You, st- right. you end up chasing your own voice and you can't right. follow pitch. So okay. I would recommend getting an interface that lets you do a blend of direct verses. Mm-hmm. Almost all interfaces have that. Um, just set the blend. But as far as the mic choice, I agree. I think the 2020 is probably the place to start. But mm-hmm. I would put them all up and let the coach see them and say, where do you want me to start? Yep, yep, yep. Absolutely. Next question. James Clendenden, I believe. I uh, hope I get that right from Vancouver. On Zoom, is there a really strong mute management that can be run using uh, regular expressions, I believe, for groups? It's regex. So. Go ahead, Roscoe. Andy has, where in the chat, you can control Zoom OSC coming. So, yeah, there's some really awesome stuff coming using regular expressions. But it wouldn't be a regular expression. It would just be in chat with a special command. Yeah. Next question. Patrick Shonis of Little Rock, Arkansas. I'm experiencing issues between Waves version 12 plugins and Adobe Creative Suite. Plugin manager freezes when scanning for plugins. If V12 plugins are installed, has anyone had similar issues? Go ahead, Tucker. I have not had similar issues, but I would reach out to Waves. They typically, anytime they do an update between like 9 to 10, 10 to 11, they typically have an application that they'll send out or that you can get that you run and it corrects the database issues that, that tend to cause that problem. Mm-hmm. Mickey? Yeah, I would also check in case in, in the plugins folder. I don't know if you're in Mac or PC, but the, if the plugins folder has still has the il- Waves 11 uh, component there, sometimes uh, that has caused issues in the past. Next question. Uh, comes from Mike Burns, Spokane. It, Alex just referenced using NDI in the cloud. What does that exactly mean? Go ahead, Tucker. Uh, NDI in the cloud, there's a lot of us using AWS. There's some people using Azure. There's some people using other cloud services. But basically, we have very, well, varying sizes, but in my case, relatively large. And in uh, Jeff Kethley's extremely large environments running uh, things like vMix, things like uh, Zoom for captures, uh, all sorts of different tools, PowerPoint, all sorts of different things, and we can't get to the data center to plug things in, so we wind up using they NDI you to... You can't, yeah, you can't go in there and say, I got some XLRs. Can I plug them in here? Like, you I mind got, if just, I... Uh, yeah, just, it'll, it'll it just won't take be a, a minute. problem. <laughs> yeah, can I put this PCI card in there? Um, yeah, so we use NDI to do that, and uh, the one of the nice things about being in a data center is the fact that typically on most instances, you've got 25 gigabit network cards in every machine. Um, and so you can wind up doing a lot of transport. I've moved a lot. Jeff Kefley has moved way more data around inside. Right. It's really the only way to get between these different apps. The app itself can, can hold the audio. I mean, hold, hold the uh, video, you know, in itself, it can process it, but how do you get from vMix to zoom? How do you get from zoom to vMix? How do you get from, and the only real way to do that, that, uh, you know, the, the, the only way that you can do it at low latency you know, and, and kind of in an established way as NDI. I mean, you can, there's SRT as well, but of course that's not going to be a low latency solution, not really a production solution. It is how you might end up with contribution from the real world though. So you might have SRT sitting on the outside of the world, feeding video into the cloud, but once it gets into the cloud, then the interaction between all the apps is NDI. Um, next, uh, go, go ahead, Tucker, real quick. Um, I, I'm really interested in one of the workflows I'm interested in, Alex, is using the uh, AWS encoder into media live and then srt from media live back into the instances i I don't have the hardware to check it but that's something i'm interested in i do (laughs) if you want me to plug it in i know you do and that's why i'm I'm happy to put it in for as an example so yeah and and and, yeah so i've got two test units that i use for for all of that so it's easy for me to throw uh signals onto that and and uh, let you play with it so just let me know what you need um next question Jake Hamilton in North Hollywood says, editors and producers, how are you marketing yourselves? How are you finding clients who need you? Any, anyone want to? Uh, yeah, go ahead, Leland. 
Well, we started with the referral here from office hours to do the Public Health Institute event. That sprung us forward with another referral, but those referrals also build on to your experience and you can take that experience with you to the next person that you're going to promote your mm -hmm. offer to. Uh, I highly advise getting a small organized brochure together, maybe put a price list bullet price list together for small items, base it on attendees or presenter number of kind of go that route and then come up with a way that you can monopolize a market niche that you're working in. If it's something in particular to your, your good trade, Chris. Yeah. I've said it before. Companies don't hire companies. People hire people. Uh, mm -hmm. And keeping a network of people and being, you know, Alex always says, don't be weird, <laughs> you know, <laughs> don't be, you know, and you have to you have to remember that. And there are many producers that I've worked with over the decades, decades uh, through multiple companies uh, because people hire people yep. and you just have it's networking, letting mm -hmm. people know what you do. My father always said, when you lose a job, never, never be shy about saying, hey, I need work. Mm -hmm. So talk to people, say hey, this is what I can do. And YouTube, 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 show people what you can do. Yeah, the, the world has changed. It used to be you worked with people in a geographic area. That is gone. As we are seeing on this panel, it is just as likely that I can be working for somebody in Greece or in Nome, Alaska, than I can be working for somebody next door. Understand you're in a new environment. So literally everything you do on your computer that goes out to the world is part of your marketing. How you comport yourself, the reputation you build in a vir virtual space is your marketing at the fundamental level. So just be aware of that and be conscious of what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, being part of a community, I mean, I, the all almost a huge portion of my work has come from, whether it's Pixel Core or MacBreak or other things like that. And it's kind of a constant thing that I'm working on, you know, and it's not something that I don't have any way to sell anything fast. I'm not a sales guy. You know, all I do is I, I, my, my fundamentals that I'm always paying attention to is serve the market that I'm part of, you know, be part of that community, be, you know, create something that's useful for that, create, whether it's learning materials or conversations or other things like that, be part of those. One of the things that people, people can do, for instance, is be, be useful in things like discord or even come on the panel here and be part of that, part of that. And you're in front of a lot of people. Um, talking about, you know, this stuff. Now, the key is, is not to be salesy, you know? So, so what you want to do is, you know, you want to be on and just be on like, and there's not any, the hardest thing to do is to be, to be committed to something, but not attached to it, you know, and to like, you know, it'd be great if you had more work, but what you really want to do is figure out how you just authentically serve the market that you're part of. And in this case, maybe be on the panel sharing what you know in those processes. And that starts to establish you. Um, I think a couple of people here have benefited from that, <laughs> that, that process here. Um, and, uh, and so, uh, you know, being when you're sharing that out to everyone else and making it available, um, it helps. And then the other thing I would say is do projects. Like if you've got the best thing about it is most of us have gear now that we can do reasonably good projects. Don't stop. Don't ever. Milkshakes. 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 Yes. Free, free is the, is the, is the, uh, Free is the straw that drank a thousand milkshakes. You know, find things, find projects that that you can do for other people with nonprofits and your own and everything else. Get into markets because, you know, like we're trying to work out this thing with John to do, um, John Idelson to do this thing at, you know, a diving project. That's going to be something that a bunch of us kind of volunteer our time for. I'm going to volunteer hardware and time and things and everything else. I'm going to do it because it's cool. Like, like there's no, like, I don't have any, like, I don't, if nothing happens other than that, I'll learn more about backhauls. I've already done underwater stuff, but I'll refine my solution so that when the next client sees it, but what are the chances that some client's going to see some example or me being able to refer to that as, Hey, look at what we did here, you know, and I'll sell that and I'll make, you know, I'll make a lot of money out of that. You know, that, that project will be very profitable for me somewhere a year from now, two years from now, but you have to keep on doing those long bombs and, and get, get people excited. Go ahead, Chris, real quick. And then, and then we're going to power through a couple questions real quick. Right after I said, you know, people hire people, I got a message from somebody on discord and I, I reiterate, use your first and last name on discord. Otherwise yeah. Alex will kick you off. We deal with people. We don't deal with handles. We don't deal with nicknames. Yeah. This is a professional environment where you shake a hand, join the conversation, tell us what you do. 
be part of it. Like work, work those so things many out. Be part of the part of a community here. Like we so have many of us have worked together. The, 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 um, there's so much work crossing between this community. Like you got to get like millions of dollars of work that's already churning through that is based on what happened. Watch your back, community. you'll get run over if you're not careful. <laughs> but, but it's just, you know, it's, it's a really like, there's so much going on at the moment, you know, and the, I gently told everybody at the beginning, oh, put your first name, last name and put a picture of you. That is, that was, I was gently pushing it along, but the reality is the reason I ask you to do that is so that you get to know each other and, you know, and then people hire each other and the people don't get how important that is. It creates a calmer conversation, a more authentic conversation, a lot less firestorms that go through the system. Um, but it also means that we're knowing, we're getting to know each other and these stupid handles are, are not part of the thing. Handles are stupid, you know? And, and so, I mean, they're, they're great if you're, if you're a, freedom fighter in, 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 uh, in Afghanistan, you know, like not a, like, but I mean, like trying to, you know, fight the oppressive government or whatever. And you want to with information, not with, not violently or, or, or in Egypt or whatever. Those are, there's valid reasons why you have oppressive governments and you're trying to be anonymous and you, you need to, and I've worked with folks to help them make sure that you can't even route back to them. So I get that, but this isn't that. Like, you know, and this random, like, I just want to have a handle is stupid. Like, it's just dumb, you know, because you, it means that every post that you put up there is an empty post that doesn't, doesn't connect you to the community. You're like wasting your time in these other communities with those handles, you know, and without that picture and without people getting to know you and, and everything else. Um, so there's a huge opportunity in this, inside of this community. I arrogantly think that the discord community that we have and that's backed up with this is one of the best on the internet for production, you know, and the people that the, the kind of people that it attracts and the kind of people that it brings together here are doers and they're respectful and they're, and they're, you know, more, more likely to be trustworthy, more likely to be good people to work with because it's not fun for the, it's not fun to be, you know, um, an undesirable, <laughs> you know, in our group because it's just, there's no, there's no, there's no there there, you know, and so, you know, working with, you know, volunteering on things like I think that the, the, the folks working on the remotes, you know, the band is going to be something, you know, it's going to turn into something, you know, and what Sky's doing is turning into something, what Hosmux turning into something. And so helping people out in those areas and helping build that up as a group, they're, you know, blazing new paths that we're going to, you know, pull, you know, we're going to be in the wake. You know, like, you know, like, you know, like basically drafting off of off of them. And so what we want to do is help them move forward so that they can open up that opportunity. And then we all go through the gate. <laughs> so, so, you know, like, so that's the, and that's what, you know, that's kind of the, um, the process, uh, you know, and, and they're leading that, that option. So help the people here that are doing interesting things. We're running out of time. Um, uh, we're going to do a power session here in the next three minutes and answer a bunch of questions. And we're going to go to, we're going to jump to Ray. So go oh, next question. Jesse Mills here in the panel from San Francisco. I'd like to experiment with creating a virtual tool 360 knot VR with embedded Vimeo videos and information points. Anything out there that's high quality and simple for end users? I would check out the Theta website. I think that they have some links to folks that are using what, you know, using their products for 360 video and 360. Uh, I think that they're like simple 360 tours. Um, the, the, the company that does it the best right now, in my opinion, is Matterport. You know, you just throw it in. It, the 3D stuff is not that interesting, but its ability to do tours is really high quality. Um, you can jump through and have little jump to here, jump to here, jump to here. It's really good at automatically. Like if you, if you get a Matterport, you can just wander through a whole space and, and, and gather all of the stuff. As long as one space can see the other one, you can get an enormous amount of, of touring data and it builds it all up for you. I mean, I think it's probably the most interesting one of the live tour area. Um, and, and the imagery is really great, even if it's not, you don't need the, the 3D models are worthless, but the imagery on it is really great. And the 3D part, the LIDAR part or whatever they're using makes it, um, that's why it stitches together so quickly and easily. Next question. Sky Gleason of Seattle, Adobe Premiere topic. Anyone else having issues where you can only export media through the media in quarter, not directly from Premiere? I haven't seen that. Go ahead, Jeffrey, real quick. I just used it yesterday. I didn't have a problem. Usually I go through a media encoder. I had to do something specific on this end, so I didn't have a problem. Okay, ne thank you. Ne next question. James Babbitt of San Diego. There is a safe driving mode screen on the iPhone during the pre-show. The video is turned off. How do you add this screen in Zoom? 
safe driving mode. Uh, go ahead, Grant. Yeah, in, in the iOS app, you swipe left, which doesn't mean reject. Um, keep swiping left and it'll it'll go to a, um, a safe driving mode. You swipe back right and then you get into the regular mode. There you go. The finally one use of left and right swiping that I don't hate, which I hate. I hate left and right swiping because it's always you always get it by accident. All right, next question. Mike Burns in Spokane. Any chance office hours will start doing any midday events for those of us who are retired who need sleep? <laughs> so um, Monday. Monday, not midday, but um, Monday we will go on at 6. So 6 p.m. will add. We're not subtracting the Monday morning one, but Monday at 6 o'clock, and I'll put that announcement out um, over the weekend, but the 6 o'clock in the evening, we will be doing um, a session. I'm hoping that Stuart and Grant and a couple other folks will show up. Tucker is going to show up. Um, so so we're going to start testing Mondays to see if Mondays turn out to be a, a booming uh, night that we have uh, there, then we'll add more days. But I'm going to start off with with Monday. I got to also figure out how I I can't be at all of this. So so we have to kind of figure that out too. Okay, we're going to move on. Um, so let's jump into the second hour. What we want to do is is give uh, I'm going to give Ray a little time to give us an overview of what he wants to talk about. Ray, do you have um, presentation materials that you want to show us? Yeah. So let's yes, let. I do. And, and how much time do you think you need to do that? I'm going to try and cram that into 20 minutes and then save the rest of the hour for questions. Perfect. Perfect. So Ray, um, I'm going to hand it off to you and let it, let us have you walk. There's so much visual with color theory that I did. We don't usually do this with slides and everything else, but I really felt like Ray's got to get us on the same page and then we're, and then we're going to, uh, then we'll, we'll hit him up for questions. So, so go ahead, take it away, Ray. All right. Let me just, uh, by way of introduction, let me say I'm a retired electronics engineer. I, cut my teeth early career in remote sensing satellite ground stations and stuff of that kind. And then, uh, uh, in, but I was dealing with imaging and I was dealing with processing images way before Photoshop. And, uh, uh, in the last seven years of my career, I stepped into all, uh, color science working for Creo, mostly in the printing industry, but in the last part of my career, my interests of late i uh i started flying drones with 6k cameras and so i started getting interested in video and high dynamic range and that's where i am today and that's what i'm studying today my objective is to give you a foundation in human perception i got some fascinating questions the other day and after hours i'm going to address those in my presentation uh i'm going to be trying to show you how we map physical stimuli to the perception in the human brain. All right. And so I'm going to try and cram that into 20 minutes. And if you can allow me to share my, uh, my screen, Mickey gives me the thumbs up and whoops, just one second. And I will get in the correct mode here and hit share screen and then do this so now do all of you see uh my window here yes. color science for the after hours team here we go folks fasten your seat belts First question is, what is color? Color is a perception in the brain. Everybody thinks about it as physical things, like it's a pigment on something, so forth. No, no. I'm defining for the, this presentation, color is a perception in the human brain. All right? So what's necessary to see color? The first step is we've got to have illuminant, incident light. Now, this is reflected items. We're going to get to video. Hang in there. Uh, we're going to have to have light. We're going to have to have a colorant of some kind on some object or photograph or what have you. And then we have to have the eye and the brain. And it finally happens in the brain. Okay. In 1670, Isaac Newton figured out that white light really is made up of a full spectrum of colors. That spectrum runs from 400 to 700 nanometers. That's wavelength, folks. Uh, so 
400 is deep blue, 700 is red, in the middle we have green. So those are the spectral colors in the spectrum. All right, here's an example of an, a D65 illuminate, approximately daylight. And you'll notice it's heavy in the blue, lighter in the reds. Here's a typical uh, incandescent bulb, which is very heavy in the red, very light in the blue. Here's Now, here's where we can get in trouble. Some of the early cool fluorescent uh, lamps have spikes in their spectrum. You notice these. And that can really play havoc with CCD arrays and so forth. Now, why does something look green? It's because it absorbs all the other wavelengths of light and reflects only green. Keep in mind, it absorbs all the other wavelengths. So objects are reflectors. Objects do not make light. Rather, they only reflect it. We're talking now about reflective media. In short, they alter the incident light so lighting, your incident lighting, makes a difference in your colors. So what about us? What part do our eyes play in the color world? How do we test them? How do we see? Do, do we all see the same? This is a real key factor. And how can we know? Well, first of all, basics. We've discovered that in the human eye, our color perception resides in cells called cones and there are cones now this is oversimplified that are sensitive to red green and blue light rgb we've all heard of that all right so additive color theory says we can make up or stimulate the perception of any color which is red green and blue please take note of something here in this chart if you combine red and blue you get magenta if you combine red and green you get yellow if you combine green and blue you get cyan you might have heard of those magenta yellow and cyan colors we'll come back to them later now here's a surprise for you or a surprise to many of you the fovea is the center of the eye and your sharp high resolution clear vision only subtends a two degree angle it's a little bigger than a dime at arm's length surprised at that your eye does little ticks around to pick up details when you're reading and trying to perceive details but your your sharp vision is very small in the center of your eye. Now, in 1931, CIE is the French words for the international color boys. Guild and Wright characterized the visual response of the human eye. Well, how did they do that? First of all, they have an observer over here, and you can see that they had a slit that only subtended the two degrees, so they are only illuminating the fovea. And over here, they have a baffle, and on one side of the baffle, they put, they put a mask so that they could see one spectral color. Over on this other side, they had illuminants, red, green, and blue, and they asked the observer to turn dials until they could get the color on both sides of this baffle to exactly match. And then they could read out the amount of energy that was required to match the color by stimulating only red, green, and blue. So this was the first mapping of the human response. Keep in mind this was at a certain light level, because light level changes the response. And uh, keep in mind that it was set to a certain white point. All right. Here is their results. Now, if you pick up nothing else from this talk, really notice this graph. All right. This is a graph of the response of the human eye and brain. Keep in mind, I keep saying brain, and you're going to see why here in just a moment. Here's the blue response. Okay. Notice the amount of energy it takes. Blue is a higher energy uh, wavelength than a red or green, but I, I'm not going to dive in that pit. Now, here's where the fun begins. 
green is in the middle and it's where most of the illuminance information is. And here's the green response. Now then, let's look at red. Red, first of all, has an incredible amount of crosstalk with green. These are not narrow band filters that are in our eyes. They overlap considerably. So we're really getting a red with some green sent by that nerve, and we're getting green plus red sent by that nerve. Notice that the red even gets some crosstalk from the blue, and somehow the brain looks in at these crosstalk signals and tells us, a hey, this is, is this, red, green, or blue. Is this why yeah. some some folks that are red, green, uh, colorblind has this not quite filtering correctly you're one slide ahead no <laughs> oh, okay okay you, you, i was like oh now i understand <laughs> yes this this is why red green colorblind is the most common type of colorblindness so here's some oversights in their experiments gildan wright included only 17 people in 1931 <laughs> all were male none were pre-tested for colorblindness <laughs> okay and so then let's ask the question. Remember, they only tested the fovea, the center of human vision. So is that the right thing? So most objects we view and cover, cover a larger area of our eye than two degrees. So does this have any effect? So in 1964, the CIE redid the experiment and they opened up this aperture to 10 degrees and said, does this make a, a difference? What if we stimulate the eye over more than just the fovea? Now we get a new set of charts. Notice that the solid line here is the 10 degree perception of color, and this is the 2 degree perception of color. Now then, have you ever gone to the paint store with your spouse, and they hand you these little bitty chips, little paint chips, and you run home and you hold them up to the drapes and you hold them up to the rug and you say, oh, yes, this is the color. This is the color patch that I want. Run back and you buy five gallons of paint. Come back and you start painting the wall. That doesn't look exactly the way I thought it would. That's because you're now hitting that uh, much larger color area and that affects your color perception. How many of you knew that? At any rate, the size of the color patch changes your color perception. And here's the measurements to show it. All right. That chart that I just showed you is energy. But the eye is not linear. It's another logarithmic device. And so uh, a fellow by the name of uh, Hunter came along and said, I've got to rescale the map, and I'm going to try and create a color space where equal movements uh, are equal perception changes. All right? And so he came up with the LAB color space. This is a color space you want to become familiar with. It's the heart of understanding color science. And when you have LA, something measured in LAB, you can uh, tolerance it in delta E. All right, let's go to LAB color space. Came out in 1945. First of all, let's look at the L axis, which is the vertical axis on my graph here. Zero in LAB, and that's the L. And by the way, when you refer to one element of LAB, you say L star. So the L star value starts at zero for absolute black. And if you had something that was 100% reflective paper, that's a diffuse object, not a mirror, okay, it would be 100 in the L star axis. In the color axes, we have magenta over here on the A star axis, plus values going out to 100 uh, are uh, magenta, minus values, are green. Green and magenta are opposites in the color space. The B star axis runs from blue to yellow, and that's plus 100 to minus 100. 
if you take that 100 by 100 by 100, well, it's actually 100 by 200 by 200, uh, that is much bigger than the eye can actually see. So we don't fill that entire space. You can create LAV numbers that don't exist. All right. So tolerancing it, if I pick a space out here in three dimensions, this would be mid-gray, and then I come out to green and blue out here, then I decide I want one delta E. It's a sphere around that in this three space. If I want to measure the delta E if I have two values of L, A, B, and I want to specify their tolerance, it's the square root of the sum of the squares. So here's the two L values, okay, the difference squared, the A squared, B squared. So that will tell you what the delta E is between two different colors. Uh, what is the best color tool? Why use a color measurement instant? Isn't the eye good enough? I want you to all right. stare at one, one, one question. Are, are you, before we leave lab, are you, what's the relationship between lab and YUV? YUV is energy and uh, versus LAB. Okay. I, I, I don't want to dive too okay. deep into that. Okay. Um, stare at the X in the center of this for the next 10 or 15 seconds. Right at the X, stares absolutely at the X. You'll notice while you're staring that in your peripheral vision, the green is on the left and the red is on the right. Stare at the X. And now I'm going to give you a blank white screen. Which one's green? Which one's red now? Did everybody get the swap? It's the right. magenta and cyan for me. Yeah. All right. Now, that fades. Since I'm from Canada, or living in Canada, I have dual citizenship, stare at the dot in the middle of the flag. I don't think the Canadian flag is this color, but if you stare at that dot, stare at that dot, stare at that dot, here it is now in red and white. Everybody get that effect? Yeah. If you didn't get those effects, let me give you a more interesting one, I think. So what this is showing is the limitations of retinal fatigue. You know, there's... Oh, never mind. Okay, so we're limiting... And we also have poor color memory. If you want to compare any two colors, you need them side by side. Your eye does auto-white balance. It reads all colors in a particular thing in front of you based on the thing it identifies as white. If you have paper that is brown, it will identify, I'm talking manila color, it will identify that if, if nothing else in your vision is there, it will uh, identify the manila color as white, and it will shift your perception of all the other colors in the picture based on the white point that it sees on a reflected media. So it judges color based on the lightest thing in the image. Now, are these grays the same or different? Well, it turns out they're exactly the same. How about these oranges? One lighter or darker? And now if that isn't strong enough for you, how about this? The blue on the left most people see it as considerably darker than the blue on the right. It's not. It's the same color, guys. Now, that's the that to me is the strongest effect. And we use the blue and yellow because even the red-green colorblind people can see this. All right. Is that an effect or is that an effect? So, here's the key point. Your eye is not an instrument. A guy asked me in after hours the other day, well, Ray, doesn't a certain uh, frequency of light, a certain wavelength of light, always map in all people right to the same perception? The answer is no, it doesn't even map to the same place in this one person if the surrounding colors are different. So your eye is not an absolute instrument, and that's the most clear illustration of it I've ever seen. 
it's one of the all reasons right. that that it, it, you can always tell a room is my is a room that I work in because it's all gray. <laughs> yeah, like, like, it's all, just like a... this background, I just paint everything gray. I just like and, and every office for the last twenty years is just like, and we'll make it a, it will make it gray. You know, and, a serious um, a colorist in the printing business. I used to I used I designed a soft proofing system it used a high end monitor and then it had a viewing booth right beside it. The entire room that it was in was lit with D five five fifty. Uh, right. 5,000 degree Kelvin light, okay. and uh, <laughs> goes his <this> time. <laughs> Sorry, woke up. Any, any rate, uh, uh, it it it. Uh, so it was D50, and then the final thing is the colorist judging the color should wear a black shirt, so that his the color of his shirt is not reflected in the monitor. I see hands up. Yep. All right. well, let's, let's, let's finish it and then we'll jump to questions. If you have questions, put them into Mukana um, and then we'll keep we'll keep moving. Okay, thank you. Uh, I just want to so, finish the presentation and then go into discussion. Right, so. and we're not too far from there. Retina fatigue, poor color memory, background effects. We discovered all of those. And here's another one. Do you see a number in this chart? Okay, if you don't, you might be red, green, colorblind. So if you don't see 42, you got may have a problem. So, retinal fatigue, poor color memory, background effects, color blindness. One in 13 males is colorblind. There's somebody on this panel that's probably red, green, colorblind. Uh, however, right I'm, I'm, pulling up the, I'm pulling up the rear on that one. I can't. Even when you tell me there's 42, I can't see it. <laughs> like, like, Seriously? I can't, even, I can't even look for it. I can't even look. Like, I can't, <laughs> like, I can't even see that. I can't even see the thing. And I work in color. Wow. How, yeah, hallelujah for scope. You used to work in well, color. Well, <laughs> now, uh, no, no, you know, and funny females, is that... it's only one in 300. But before the ladies in the audience get too uppity, they said, I know why my husband can't pick out matching socks. The females carry the gene that is transferred to their male offspring only for red-green color blindness. The women carry the gene. You get red-green color blindness from your mother. It's not expressed in the female. My my grandfather that? on my, my grandfather on my mother's side. What's that? My grandfather on my mother's side. Whoops. Uh, red, green, and gray were the same. Like that's yes, how, that's like right. to him, it was completely yeah. like he couldn't even so, see the colors. Lightest color, failure to adopt good viewing habits often results in bad color decisions. Right. All right. So, and stress, time of day, fatigue, ambient conditions, all will affect the way we see color. And finally, age. Our, our lenses in our eyes yellow with age. So, man, have I convinced you that the human eye is not necessarily an instrument? All right. Now. If you don't get anything else out of this talk, the next two slides are key, all right? Here I have the human perception graphs that I've explained what they mean. And here what I'm doing is I'm imagining that I have a yellow LED and I'm, stim and I'm sending it out at about 575 nanometers and this will appear yellow to a human viewer. The reason it appears yellow is because it equally stimulates the red and the green cone. Does everybody understand that part? Am I okay? All right, so here's a nice single wavelength of light that creates the sensation yellow in the brain. However, I can also have two LEDs, one red and one green, and put out equal parts of energy and create the exact same sensation in the brain. This is how we simulate colors with RGB devices like monitors. All right? So what we want to do in all color reproduction systems is control the amount of energy that stimulates those red, green, and blue cones. So once again, I can do it with a single wavelength of light and create yellow. I can create the same sensation in the brain with two. I'm now playing, if we had music, a chord in wavelengths, and that creates the exact same sensation in the brain. 
Now, there are colors that don't exist in the spectrum. If I put a red and blue, that color does not exist. There's no single wavelength that can produce this color, and that's magenta. Magenta always has to be reproduced with a cord or two wavelengths of light entering the eye. That is key. Now, this fact that I can match or create the same color sensation in your eye, I'm going to introduce a big word, the most abused word in all of color science. This ability to match using dual stimulus versus a single wavelength or spectral versus color metric input is metamerism. Metamerism is a good thing. No color reproduction system could work without metamerism. Everybody mistakenly labels the fact that if you view something with different colors of light, uh, it may change color. That's color consistency, not metamerism. Metamerism. I is challenge. The fact. I challenge everyone watching to use that word next week in a, in a conversation exactly. and have it naturally show up. Metamerism. <laughs> but it's the most. It, how many of you have heard that word? It. Oh. oh okay. Oh, we, okay. We Some that. have. All right. Well, it's quite often it's abused. At any rate. So summary. What is color? It's a sensation in the brain. C I E L A B is a model of human perception. LAB is device-independent color. Instruments can measure color more consistently than the eye. Okay, imaging devices. Cameras are RGB. Uh, monitors RGB. Film is just uses cyan, magenta, and yellow. Why? And, and so do printers. Real quickly, if you have That's a it. white piece of if you have a white piece of paper, it reflects all wavelengths of light. All right? And you're going to put ink, transparent ink. I this does not a, a work for paints. Transparent ink used in the printing industry. You, if you lay down a cyan, it reflects it does not affect blue <coughs> and green. It subtracts red, though. It absorbs red. Magenta subtracts green, but it reflects red and blue. And yellow r does not affect red and green, but subtracts blue. So in order to color, to control the light coming off a piece of paper, you use a subtractive primaries, but each Cyan, magenta, yellow only affects the amount of energy going to those cones again in your eyes that are red, green, and blue sensitive. That's the explanation for CMY. So now we also hear color spaces. Uh, sRGB was the old CRTs. Adobe 98 was introduced primarily for photography. Profoto, I'm not going to dive into it. Then What's more uh, interesting to this group is we have REC 709, which is the HD color space. We have REC 2020, which is now the uh, 4K uh, high dynamic range color space. Your monitor is R has an RGB color space that's unique to your individual monitor, and you have to profile it to calibrate it to any of these. By the way, all of those above are synthetic color spaces. Uh, particularly the top three, there's no device that exactly reproduces them. You have to calibrate a monitor to reproduce them. You do that by using an ICC profile. An ICC profile is simply a table that maps RGB It has two tables, A to B and B to A. It maps RGB to the LAB color space, device independent color space. It has a second table that is the reverse of that and can match LAB to RGB. How does it use? 
Here is an example of Photoshop or Final Cut Pro. Here we have, let's say we bring in a file that has an RGB profile in the, in the file image. All right. It, first thing it does is takes those RGB values in the file, run them through the A to B table, and output LAB, device independent color. It goes up to your special measured monitor profile that you used a colorimeter or a spectrophotometer to measure, and it goes through the LAB to RGB, and now it puts out the special, one-of-a-kind RGB values that make your monitor match those LAB colors set up to it. All right? Same thing happens in Final Cut Pro, only this is 709 or 2020 uh, for this, this input color profile but your monitor still has this profile, all right? So there I am. Did I make it through in 20 minutes? Puff, puff, puff. Not and quite, but it was worth it. It was worth it. That was great. Everybody, big hands. That was great. You know, I, I think that there's a lot of things that, you know, that's the kind of stuff that we want to get dig into because we can't really start talking about high dynamic range and, and a lot of other things without understanding those basics of, of how that works, you know, and... Uh, so it's invaluable to kind of walk through that. Thanks, Ray. Um, I really, that was a great, uh, great overview. Go ahead, Greg, and then we'll jump to questions. I had no idea. I had no idea, Ray. This just, thank you so much. Yeah, that's great. An incredible presentation. Um, uh, uh, first, uh, first question, Bill. Okay, we're moving on to TJ. And if panelists have questions, put them into Mukana, and then we'll people will vote on them and put them up there. We're going to go to the next question. TJ Asher, Minneapolis, Minnesota, says, Why do we still find black and white photos and films so compelling, even though we see our world in color? All right, go ahead, Ray. Yeah, uh, basically, the more primitive we are, okay, the, the thing that attracts us the most is graphic design, strong graphic things and if you do two-dimensional drawings like Inuit art or something like that uh, or Haida art uh, graphic shapes are more powerful than reading a third dimension in so this applies to dimension and it also <clears throat> applies to color yep. and if you take the color out and you have nothing but a line of graphic design deal it goes to the most primitive parts of your brain and gets your attention that's why black and white is stronger than color but Stuart, real quick part of the reason is also uh psychological much of the footage we've seen since the beginning of photography and uh, cinematography when it's become dramatic events news events almost for a century, it was always in black and white. The reason for that wasn't so much whether the film was available for shooting in color, but whether the film stock was available cheap enough to send out to theaters for that footage mm. to be played for people to see those world changing news events. But also with television, when it first started, black and white images. So like a lot of us in Australia saw the moon landing in black and white, while I believe in the US it was color. I think, I think one uh, of the Even other though things. the signal came through, it's, it's that news, it's that social psychology that the drama is shown in black and white. I think that, that one of the things we can, it also lets us do is it allows us to focus on what matters and not be distracted by a lot of other bits and pieces. Um, you know, it's just the, the actual emotion or the actual structure of it, as opposed to whether it's warm or cold or all the other coloring that might happen. Go ahead, Bill. Next question. Sky Gleason is saying, uh, film posters often use orange and blue or sometimes cyan and teal. That's a kind of famous, or teal and uh, orange. If you know about this, can you share the why and what is the magic of those two colors? Do different colors affect us in different ways? Go ahead, Ray. Red, green, colorblind people can see uh, blue and yellow and uh, <laughs> blue and orange. Seriously. <laughs> okay. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, go ahead. Next question. 
Uh, Sky is back again with this time. Can you please discuss color depth? Where and why is it important? Now, our, uh, and we're going to stick with mostly just Ray answering it because we have so many questions. So we'll, we'll uh, um, yeah, go ahead. And I'll try and make them brief. Mm -hmm. Sky, are you referring to uh, bit depth uh, for each color? Uh, HDR. Oh, high dynamic range. Oh, okay. Uh, well, that is the actual color gamut is larger in HDR, and so is the luminance range considerably higher and uh hdr is defined all the way up to 10,000 nits although there are very few devices that can do that tip most hdr televisions are a thousand nits and i've got an xdr apple xdr that can do 1600 nits in front of me yeah it we'll, we'll do a whole we're gonna do a whole second hour on hdr this is this is the precursor to uh you know getting us on the ball field before we start um so that we we kind of have a lot of the background. There'll be a couple of these, and then we're going to really start digging. Um, next question. And, and um, Ray, Ray, asked, oh, we got to keep going. We got to keep, got to keep moving. Next he, question. He John answered Credo. a lot of my questions, so oh, you great, can great. you can yep. skip mine. Okay. John Credo uh, in Las Vegas says, Ray, what would you say is the horizontal and vertical resolution of the human eye? Oh boy, um, it depends. <laughs> this is this is a Mickey answer. It depends. <laughs> okay. It turns out that the luminance resolution is three times higher than the color resolution. And NTSC video encoding depended on that. So um, l let me just tell you this. I, uh, let's talk about the color resolution. Everybody talks about, oh, I want 16 or 12-bit or 14 or 16-bit color because then I can have billions of colors. Notice the LAB color space only was 100 by 100 by 100, and I said that that more than covered the human vision. Remember, 1 delta E is what the very best eyes can see a difference in. So take the luminance scale. There's only 100 shades of gray that you'll have difficulty, except when you put it in a sky and you have stair steps right next to each other, and then you will have uh, you can have uh, a blocking and breakdown like that. Does that? Yeah, yeah. The, the color depth, you know, stair stepping, like small changes in in star. St the biggest problem we have with lower resolution is small steps from one thing to another, where you're not covering much distance. You're covering a lot of distance spatially, but not a lot in color. Is where you get those banding. Next. Question. Yeah, and primarily in the highlights. Yep, next question. Mickey from the panel in the Philippines. Going back to comparing YUV and LAB, is this similar to comparing audio VU or RMS levels to LUFS, wherein VU is derived from electrical measurements and LUFS is how loudness is perceived? It is slightly different, I believe, Mickey, in that YUV is an encoding energy levels, as I recall. I mean, and the... Our rule of thumb was is that, I mean, when we looked at it, we, we would always, I mean, for us, measurement-wise, YUV was 90 degrees uh, from lab. <laughs> the same thing, except it was 90 degrees from lab. Like it was rotated. Um, you know, and, and so when we measured it, we found that it was, that, that it may not be accurate, but it was what we measured. Um, next question. Alex 4 d our friend in London, says, dopey question, 8-bit RGB channels go, channels go from 0 to 255 so that each channel has 256 levels. In After Effects, the RGB channels go from 0 to 32,768, so each channel has 32,769 levels. How come? Well, I think we've just covered that, and that's to avoid uh, breakup in, in the uh, areas where you're spread a very uh, small change in uh, color or luminance over a large space, you'll get this uh, and the quantization. Is, the, the technical is quantization error. Yeah, and and the and the issue there is is that is that you um, the 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 challenge is that it's not so much that you may still output at two fifty six you know levels, but when you do transforms, you need to be represented at a higher level because otherwise you're losing data and then you're losing data and then you're losing data and you end up with uh, posterization. <laughs> Next question. Yeah, if you, if you're doing a, in post, if you start manipulating things like crazy, exactly, you may, you know, output eight bits, but you'll mess things up if you don't have the, those bits 
while, before you start manipulating. Yep, absolutely. Next question. Charles Klein has a great question here. What measures can a person take to maintain a healthy retina? Vitamins, hydration, eye exercises, are there things we can do? Oh mm -hmm. my gosh. Can't we all eat carrots? That's what I've been told. Yeah, vitamin D is the only thing that has been clinically proven in uh, to help. Um, I, I know that one of the things that I that I do based on some stuff that we've worked on is that my uh, my phone is always unless I'm watching a movie, my phone is always on night mode. It's always warm. <laughs> the blue coming out of the phone is, and I found an enormous amount of my eyes were much more relaxed when I started doing that. I was talking to someone who works in, on monitors and they were like, there's a reason that they're doing dark mode and they're doing night mode. And it may not be just to make it look cool. It may be that they're quietly um, taking care of your eyes before they get sued. <laughs> so, so the, um, you know, so there, there, there's a, there's a, uh, that, that all the, this move to dark mode and this move to, you know, night mode and everything else is probably good for your eyes and better for your eyes. And so the other thing we get into is, is um, so I keep everything that way, you know, in general, um, I know that, that the, uh, um, but that's the only time I turn it on. And then a lot of our HDR monitors all tell us, give us warnings not to watch them too long. Next question. Our friend Talak Lopez Waterman, when you say synthetic color space, what do you mean? Ray? Uh, what I mean there is let's take the uh, uh, Adobe 98, which is a, a common one. Uh, it, it is set up specifically for equal values of RGB to produce gray. In other words, if you have red 128, green 128, and blue 128, you get a mid-tone gray. And so it, it's defined mathematically. Uh, and so what I'm saying, to the, my knowledge, there is no device that natively behaves in that way. All right. Quite the opposite. Uh, monitors almost always electrically are linear. And then when we have to map them with a gamma curve uh, to match uh, the perception of the eye, which is logarithmic. Next question. Tim McCulloch of Wichita, Kansas says, for my reptile audio person brain, what is color space? Well, okay, it's just the gamut that contains all the colors that a device can perceive. All right. It is, uh, uh, it is the limits of that particular device. And the eye has a color gamut and so forth. Now, let me let me throw a real clunker <laughs> into things. Cameras do not really have a well-defined color gamut. And I think I can do an experiment here and uh, prove it to you. You see this device that I have in my hand? It's putting out infrared. It's not even in the visible spectrum but my camera responds to it. So this is way outside the visual gamma and my camera responds. So cameras do not have well-defined uh, gammas, gamuts. Um, it's one of the reasons, it's the secret, or one of the secrets to, um, that we learned by accident with uh, composite components green screens is that their infrared is different. <laughs> You know, so, so it like, and it actually affect, we were like, why is it, why does it look the same color and it's keys better? And we can't, we couldn't figure it out. And then we looked at it on some infrared cameras and we were like, it's black, you know? And, and so it was, you know, and so it was, it was just a really interesting um, puzzle. Anyway, next question. Stuart Fairweather, panel in Melbourne, in search of better pixels, are there any camera sensors that match the same color response curves of the human eye? What about monitors? Absolutely not. There's no device, input or output, that comes anywhere near behaving like the human eye and brain. Keep in mm. mind the brains involved here. Next question. Jake Hamilton, North Hollywood. Magenta is a primary color when you're painting, but can only be created by combining red and blue in RGB Im imaging. Are they opposites? What's what's going on? Okay, or well, red and red. Okay, he's talking about painting. That is opaque pigments, not transparent dyes that a printer puts down. I do not com 
uh, I do not claim to be an expert in paint mixing. I, okay, it's a whole, it, it actually is a whole nother game. And uh, um, any, any rate, but red and blue are at opposite ends of the spectrum. And, mm. uh, and if they are mixed, then you get magenta. Next question. Okay. Subtractive versus additive, different things. Lorasco yeah. Jones says, how can we use the eyes fovea, only cones, which is our sharpest vision to a filmmaker's advantage? Is there any uses for the blind spot? Two different things here. There's the fovea, and then every eye has a blind spot where the optic nerve comes into the eye. <laughs> and you're, as long as you have two eyes, you fill in that blind spot. Even if you only have one, your brain will fill it in for you. And uh, all you have to do is put two marks on a piece of paper about that far apart and stare at one, cover one eye, stare at the one spot on the paper, and then move it in and out, and the other one will disappear when you have it in your blind spot of where that comes in. Hmm. Good, Roscoe. Real quick. Has a filmmaker ever used that, though, to hide a character from the audience? Is there any way you can do that? Well, have you... There's different psychological effects. My, my favorite one is always the gorilla playing basketball. Have you all seen yes. that one? Yeah, that's cool. Okay. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and the stormtrooper hitting his head. Next question. Uh, James Babbitt has a practical question. Hi, Ray. What monitors or TVs do you choose based on color accuracy? Well, I have in front of me for my critical work, I have the Apple XDR monitor. And the reason I chose it, it is not a perfect uh, color monitor. Uh, for the, it's, not, it's not equal to a $43,000 monitor for monitoring uh, HDR. All right. But. Uh, the thing I love about it is it's damn good as long as you don't have little stars and a black background. That I won't. I won't. I'm not going to go into why mm -hmm. that this monitor doesn't handle that, but it has to do with its backlighting. Mm -hmm. Any rate, um, but what it does have is it holds its calibration very tightly for years, right out of the factory. And second, I can switch it to different color spaces. I can set it to a color space for high, uh, uh, high, high def television. I can set it for high dynamic range TV. I can set it for uh, P3 uh, digital cinema if I'm working in the film work. And so, you know, that's, that's my choice of Supreme Monitor for both Final Cut Pro, a Resolve, and uh, uh, Photoshop work. Question. Talak Lopez Waterman. In theater, we use the auto white balance on our eyes to our advantage by supplying a reference white in each look. Do we do the same in video? You, you, you can. I mean, if you have a white area in, in, in the field of vision, the eye will register all the other colors referenced to that lightest or whitest area in, in the field of vision. Interesting. Next question. T.J. Asher of Minneapolis says, I've heard that the human eye cannot see both red and green together at the same time. Is this true? It sees yellow. <laughs> no, that's not true. If, it, if you have red and green. Now, if I think what he's referring to is I have seen optical illusion things where they usually put red and blue, which are opposite ends of the spectrum, bars that are very saturated right together, and they'll kind of dance. And the reason they do is your eye has chromatic aberration. Its lens is a simple lens, and it can't focus on red and green or red and blue uh, at, at the same focal length. Yeah, here we go. Th those colors will dance for you. And, uh, and so, so your eye has to shift back and forth for the focus for red and blue. Most of the time, you don't even notice it. But that, that's... What the, true it can't focus on those at the same time next question jake hamilton in north hollywood said is anyone doing any color grading work without using a calibrated broadcast monitor and if so what are you using i don't think you can really i mean you can do that you can't do it <laughs> you can't do you can't do it for broadcast broadcast without without having it um go ahead uh, roscoe and then chris if you're on set when it's being shot, you can literally look at a monitor and see how accurate it is to what's right. actually appearing in the lighting available. Right, go ahead, Chris. 
I've heard you can use Alex's phone too. Just, I've heard this. I, it's known that when we're doing HDR work, I, it, I won't trust anything except for my phone when it comes to streaming. Like a, if iPhone 12, I'll look at it and I'll, and I'll make decisions about, about color because it's, it is so far other than a Sony 310 or better, it's the most accurate monitor under $10,000 know, for me is just to look at my phone, but look at it better than my iPad. Even it's just, you just look at the phone and, and, and decide if it's all, if all of its settings are off, it's, it's pretty, it's, it gives me a much better idea of what's going on. Um, Stuart. Jake, for anybody with colorblindness, you get used to using scopes rather than trusting what you see with your own eye, even on a color reference monitor. The scopes are your tools of choice. It is. So, I, so we're, by the way, we're having AJA come on and talk about the color analyzer um, next week because I love it so much. Um, anyway, so, uh, but we're going to talk and break, break that down. Um, but the, um, I cannot stress how important it is to have audio and video scopes open while you work even if you're not using them just look over at them all the time because what you'll start to do is your brain to get back to what ray's talking about will start tying together what it sees over there with what it sees over here and as you do it it's much easier than someone trying to show you just constantly have it open and look at it like oh that's a great image and then you look over at the screen and you start your, your brain starts to map what it sees based on what the numbers are. And then after a while, it's blonde brunette, you know, like it's, you know, like, it, you know, you really can look at something and understand what you're, what's actually happening. That's a matrix reference for the kids. Anyway, next, next question. Uh, Mark Hadley says, is there an interesting reason why the A and B and lab are not capitalized? They're variables. <laughs> oh, well, the L is capitalized and the A and B are lower case is the, is the standard in the industry. And again, when you refer to them individually, you talk about L star, A star, B star. Uh, next question. Comes from Michael Findley and uh, Fraley, I'm sorry, from Dallas Fort Worth. One thing I've noticed and not covered is the difference between light and paint or ink as in all colored together is light and white. Uh, we're all colored together and ink is black and white is that. We briefly touched on that. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I, Oh, wait a minute. Uh, it's between light and paint. Or, well, there's, you have to do subtractive color with pigments and yeah, inks. Reflective versus. Mm -hmm. and, and yeah, versus and emiss emissive color coming out of a monitor mm -hmm. is additive. All, all of those are trying to, remember, they're trying to control the red, green, and blue stimuli to the tones in the yep. eye. Next question. Uh, Alex Golner is in with any tips on using the Mac OS digital color meter application. Uh, no. Nope. Okay. It's next pretty, pretty dated. No. No. no next question. Mike Burns, uh, any free or affordable apps to help color calibrate a 2019 iMac? Apple killed off the old color calibration tool. You need an instrument, a colorimeter or spectrophotometer, x right and uh, what's the other brand that everybody uses? Like uh, Spider. I'm an X. What? Spider. Spider. Yeah, thank you. A lot and, of uh, spiders. And any any uh, any serious color work, you've got to have an instrument. And we just had a whole talk on why. Yep. Next question. Uh, the last one that's not centered column, uh, just Alex. Uh, Roscoe Jones, repeat if there is time, can we use the eyes phobia, only cones, which is our sharpest vision to a filmmaker's advantage? Did, did Roscoe have something? Did you want to add anything to that? Or did, was that just kind of? Well, yeah, no, we didn't get, we went off to the blind spot. And I was just wondering if there is anything we can do for filmmakers. I mean, it's basically, it's putting a vignette you know, a soft focus on the edge of everything if you think about it, but I don't know if filmmakers take advantage. Well, so, I can't okay, tell keep, you that. Keep, in visual yeah, effects, let's... we spend a lot of time on that, um, and we talk about it a lot. We purposefully drop detail on the outside edges to keep the eye from darting. So the eye will dart towards detail, and so a lot of times, short depth of field, and then, but actually lowering resolution in areas we don't want you to look at. <laughs> so we, the eye will go after detail, you know. And so I know that we we spend a lot of time talking about, oh, don't put that over there. That that's an interesting thing, but if you put it over in the corner, the eye will go away, and they'll miss a, they'll miss something that's important for the show. Um, is so we've we've definitely had things, where, especially when you're adding those things back in. Um, yeah, uh, Stuart. Uh, yes, Roscoe, you can take advantage of it. Uh, 
contrast the work of uh, Peter, is it Miller who did Mad Max and the like versus uh, who's the person who did Transformers movies I've got to think and it's like a, but Bay. one has a lot of action cutting while the camera is in motion whereas the most recent Mad Max film has everything center framed to keep everything in that sharpest part of the human vision and keep detail there. Uh, and again, it's a creative choice, but it also matches the technical reasons that Alex just covered in depth. Um, uh, if I can go a little off topic and just quickly... Well, I'm going to I, I have to... I have to... I have to... I have to... I actually have to move this to the uh, after show. I have a heart out. So, Ray, are you still available to jump into an after show and chat a little bit with folks? Yeah. yeah. So, Ray, Ray will jump into the after show. We can continue this conversation, but we're going to, uh, I'm going to go ahead and, and uh, head it over there. Um, we're, uh, we're on that. That's hence my, my speed round <laughs> was, was there. So, um, so stand by. We're going to, um, uh, we're going to push everybody over. And then if you awesome want to come job, over and Ray. continue to talk to, to Ray, uh, that's, that's the place to go. Thanks, effort, Ray. Lovely, Thanks, everyone. Uh, before, before we leave, before we leave the YouTube, thank you, Ray. That was amazing. Uh, that was great. I mean, it was the perfect first start for what we're, uh, what we're talking about. So I really appreciate you uh, spending the time and putting, a, putting together such a great presentation, Ray. So, um, and we're going to have Ray on more often to do more of these if he's willing to are you willing to come back and talk about other yeah. subjects right okay okay great we love having you so i'm so glad to see uh see you here so all right um thanks to everyone thanks for the great questions thanks to the panel uh for for being the panel you guys are awesome anyway so uh we will see you in the post show bye-bye